Look, I think the basic role of the Refugee Convention is to enable people who are fundamentally at risk because of who they are or what they believe to leave their country and find a new home elsewhere, to be productive, contributing people for as long as the risk exists. It's not an immigration system, and that's sometimes really misunderstood. Refugee status is only protection for duration of risk. So if and when a person can safely go home, she ceases to be a refugee automatically. It's like a hospital emergency room. It's a place you go to be safe, to get the help you need. It's not a place that provides you with a new home. It provides you with the ability to get on with your life again. Well, the basic definition of a refugee, we've had the same one for close to 70 years now. But I have to say, I think it's a pretty extraordinarily good definition. It talks about a person with a well-founded fear of being persecuted for one of five reasons, race, religion, nationality, social group, or political opinion. You have to be outside your country for that reason and unable or unwilling to get the protection of your home country. And so it is a vestige of the Cold War. It leads a lot of people to say that it's outdated, but quite frankly, that doesn't take account of what's happened over the last quarter century. The judges of the world, including Australian judges, have really renovated that definition. It's like what the Cubans do to those old 1960s cars. They just keep tuning them up and tuning them up so that they actually still run pretty well. And so, for example, the idea of being persecuted initially had this Cold War connotation, right? Today, every leading country has said being persecuted means you face a risk of fundamental human rights abuse of all sorts. It could be gender spousal assault, for example. It needn't be Cold War style uh, harm. Uh, because of who you are or what you believe, judges have said, well, political opinion can include, for example, standing up for law and order in a totalitarian state. Uh, social group can include your economic class, your social origins, gender, sexual orientation, things that the drafters never imagined in 1951. And so while there are some limits to the definition, it's true, you do have to get out of your country. If you can't get out of the country, it doesn't work. And it is also true, you have to show that your own country can't or won't protect you. But by the way, there too there's been progress. 20 years ago we said it, you had to be coming from a bad state. Today that's not true. If your state is incapacitated, if it's a defunct state, you still are entitled to refugee status if the risk is grave enough. And so. The definition really has been malleable in the hands of brilliant judges from around the world who talk to each other, they listen to each other, and they've kept that definition alive for the last quarter century. What, this whole idea of what a refugee gets is severely misunderstood. You would think, if you read some of the tabloid journalism, that a refugee rocks up, shouts refugee, and is issued with welfare checks, public housing, and becomes a charitable basket case for the rest of her life. And that is not the way it works. If you actually read the convention, it's all about empowering refugees to be contributing members of the places to which they go. So for example, this treaty focuses very hard on allowing refugees to start businesses, to be self-employed, to actually meet their needs and those of their families. There's no word in the convention about charity. It's all about letting refugees do for themselves. And so somebody like Chancellor Merkel in Germany, I think when faced with the Syrian crisis, understood that refugees have enormous economic potential to be contributors. We've seen this throughout the world. Uganda recently liberated its laws to enable refugees to do what the Refugee Convention requires, namely be productive. Their GDP has shot up correspondingly. And so part of the problem is that we think of refugee rights as sort of a you know, charitable wish list rather than as allowing people to do for themselves, which is in fact what the treaty requires us to do. The convention's been updated once. In the 1960s, it used to be the case that a refugee had to blink, be fleeing a phenomenon in Europe that occurred prior to 1951. Both of those limits were prospectively eliminated. So states that hadn't already signed on by the mid-60s now are required to apply the definition to people coming from any part of the world and up to the present. That's the only major change. It didn't change the substance of the definition. And so we do still have a few challenges. For example, the one I, that, that worries a lot of people is, is it unfair?
to give refugee status to a person who crosses a border and not give refugee status to a person still inside her own country. But again, I think that misunderstands the purpose of the document. The purpose of the document is to let someone who is outside a place where she has a political claim to be enfranchised by a new state. If you're still inside your own country, you're a human rights victim, but you are not disfranchised in at least formal terms from the political project. And so a person who moves inside her own country is substantively in the same situation as a person who doesn't move inside her own country. She's a human rights victim. And if we can get in to help the person who does move, we should also go in to help the person who doesn't move. Sometimes, by the way, who are more desperate. Uh, women with young children, older people don't move. And so this whole internally displaced debate, I think, has really been unhelpful in that it suggests that movement is for some reason the logical focus of our concern rather than whether we can actually help someone. The reason the Refugee Convention focuses on those who are outside is because those are the people to whom we have unimpeded access. These are the people who can claim rights, not just ask for charity. They can claim rights because they are within our power to help. If you get outside of your own state, you're always within the capacity of the world to reach. To my mind, that's a source of strength, not weakness. Even as I do believe we should be focused more on helping people inside the country to the extent we can. The problem when you get the two mixed up is that one gets played off against the other one. And ultimately, we end up doing for everyone only what we can do for people inside their state. And that's a net loss, in my view. Well, there are certainly leaders out there. I mean, for example, uh, Canada took the leadership on seeing gender or sex as a form of particular social group as a claim for refugee status. German courts have been very aggressive in understanding that the victims of war can be refugees as such. So, you know, depending on where you look, different countries have taken leadership on different issues. But the really exciting part is that there is what I call the transnational judicial dialogue, that judges actually read and talk to each other. So there are cases, for example, on particular social group where the High Court of Australia was basically talking to the House of Lords in Great Britain in its judgments. Canadian courts in turn spoke to the Australian courts. And so one of the biggest problems we have with the Refugee Convention is that unlike every other major international human rights treaty, we do not have an expert supervisory body that sits at the top of the pyramid and can say definitively, here's what the convention means. The, the Genocide Convention is the only other ancient UN treaty without such a body, but it now has the International Criminal Court. The Refugee Convention is all alone. It has an agency, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, that can assist states to implement their duties, but it has no power to require states to do anything. It can't even offer definitive interpretations of the treaty. It has no such power. And so the judges of the world have informally filled that void, but they do that imperfectly. A Swedish judge talks to an Argentinian judge, talks to a German judge, talks to a Kiwi judge, but that's not exactly the way you'd like the system to work. Uh, Michigan and Cambridge actually proposed working with the international refugee law judges f five years ago, a system to move beyond this, where we actually could have something akin to what other human rights treaties have, but the UN Refugee Agency dug in its heels and thus far has refused to come along on that project. There are a few laggards out there. Uh, I mean, I would say that the United States has always sort of stood apart from the refugee treaty. It sees itself as having a brilliant domestic system which more or less maps on to the UN Refugee Treaty, but not entirely. And so the U.S., for example, mandatorily detains refugees, which is completely illegal under the treaty it signed. It pretends that it's not, but it is. Australia uh, has obviously followed a comparable policy, completely illegal, no equivocation, under the treaty that Australia and the U.S. have signed, not permissible. So which particular policy is that? The, the duty to allow refugees freedom of movement in the Refugee Convention clicks in as soon as a refugee arrives, makes a clean breast of her circumstance, submits herself to authorities and tells them what her claim is, at that point the duty is on the government to justify any further detention. The duty is not on the refugee at that point. She's done what international law requires. So many governments that pursue an ongoing detention policy after they've vetted identity and security concerns do act illegally. 
Another big concern we've got right now, obviously, that you've seen in Europe, uh, tragically, over recent years, is the building of barriers to entry, where we simply erect barbed wire or other blockades. President Trump wants a wall. Well, all of those kinds of blunt barriers make it impossible for a person to do what the Refugee Convention, in theory, permits a person to do, namely show up at the border, make a claim, and if the country has signed the treaty to be protected. If the wall can't hear your claim, then it's impossible for you to get what international law in theory offers. So that's an example of behavior that is at odds with the object and purpose of the treaty, but which hasn't been successfully challenged because there is no international supervisory authority that can say that it's definitively wrong. No, I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that most people want to move beyond that state of first arrival. I mean, this is, ten, this is one of the really nasty parts about the way refugee law has evolved in recent years, though, is that there's come to be this notion that a refugee should stop in the first place she arrives. I have no idea where this came from. It's not in the refugee convention. It's not part of international law. And yet governments mouth it as though it's a policy. It's a completely illogical policy because what it does is to create bottlenecks wherein refugees are basically stopped at the first place they arrive, often very poor, desperate countries themselves. So we've now ended up with a situation where 60% of the world's refugees are in just 10 countries, even though nearly 150 countries have signed the treaty. All of those countries are very poor, difficult countries. So the idea that you should simply stop rather than moving on not only is illogical. I mean, of course you're going to move on to where you think you're safe and you have a shot at rebuilding your life. But it's bad geopolitically. It's bad geopolitically because it creates antagonism in frontline states that understandably aren't going to keep their doors open if they think that they're stuck with the responsibility for the whole world just because of an accident of geography. This is the single biggest challenge in international refugee law right now. There is nothing that comes close to this. The idea that every state has an independent responsibility to anyone who shows up at its borders and that the rest of the world effectively owes it nothing is completely wrong. The preamble to the convention talked about a system of shared burdens and responsibilities. We've never implemented it. The UN had a meeting last September where for the first time they finally decided they would have an intergovernmental conference to talk about this, but the UN offered nothing of any significance. It was a plan to have a plan to have plans. A lot of rhetoric with absolutely no mechanism to make it work. And so part of the problem is that governments are being asked, they're being put in an impossible position where when large numbers of refugees arrive at their territory, I mean, I'm not talking a few hundred or thousand as in Australia. I'm talking about millions of refugees arriving in a place like Kenya or Af uh, Afghans arriving in Pakistan or Syrians arriving in Turkey, Lebanon and others. These are the real refugee crises in the world where, yes, we sometimes give charity. Yes, we sometimes resettle a few hundred or thousand of the millions that these poor states are receiving. But a country like Lebanon now has one out of every three human beings in Lebanon is a refugee, right? So this would be like having eight million refugees in Australia. You cannot even imagine it. It's beyond contemplation. And yet we, the best we can do in this grand meeting last September is the UN says, well, let's have a plan so that when there is a large scale movement, we will get together and have a meeting and we will use these principles to come up with a plan. Well, that's garbage, quite frankly. I think it makes a sham of the entire idea of shared responsibility. The UN Refugee Agency should have put something much more definitive on the table, a plan that guarantees access, assigns responsibility, creates opportunities for refugees to enjoy empowering protection for duration of risk, shares out the costs and the responsibilities, and ultimately provides solutions to refugees. That's not been proposed. None of those pillars is in the UN's refugee plan. And so right now we've got more than 10 million refugees who've been waiting on average nearly 20 years for a solution with absolutely nothing in sight. Nothing. That's the tragedy of the refugee system. Not a few refugees coming to the US or the Australian border that can easily deal with them. You know, so we whine a lot. But the real hardship of the current refugee system is with states far, far away from any developed country.
states that have for way too long done the lion's share of work with no binding burden or sharing responsibility for the rest of us. That's what needs to change. Not the convention, but the way we do the convention. There is nothing in the Refugee Convention that prohibits us from coming up with a system of international administration, shared responsibility with different states doing different jobs. We've actually come up with a model that would cost less than what we now spend to process refugees and do more for refugees, guaranteeing every refugee a solution by at least year six or seven. Nobody waiting 20 years for a solution. There are some countries like Australia that probably are better resettlement countries than they are first asylum states. My view is we should let different countries do different jobs. We need them all. That kind of creativity has not been forthcoming from the UN or from governments, and that's where I think we need to have this conversation begin. People that say the problem is the convention, if I may be blunt, probably haven't read it. What the convention says if you do meet this definition, being genuinely at risk of critical abuse because of who you are or what you believe, you have the right to try to make your life in dignity until and unless you can go home. That's the simple thrust of it. So what would these people want to change? Would they want to say that more people should get status, that fewer people should get status? I mean, wh what are we saying there? I think we've struck a pretty neat balance with the definition that we've got. For example, some climate-induced migrants are refugees. The courts in New Zealand found that last year. Not everyone, but those who face abuse because of who they are or what they believe. The government pr provides help to black people but not white people, for example. They are refugees. So that's not the problem. Is the problem with the rights regime? What, you, you don't want refugees to be productive? You don't want them to educate their children? You don't want them to get a job and meet their own needs? What, what do you want them to do? It makes sense to me. So the only thing that's missing here is a system that actually spends money intelligently. I mean, we now waste more money determining refugee status for the 10% of refugees who arrive in rich countries than to meet the needs of the other 90% of the world's refugees put together. One country, Great Britain, spends more on its system than is being spent on protracted refugee situations. That is wasted money. It pays for lawyers and judges and bureaucrats. We ought to be spending the money on refugees. Have simple international administration based on group-based criteria up front quickly assign people to a place for protection of duration of risk, probably in the region of origin for the first few years, so that they can be functionally compatible and get on with their lives. At year six or seven, those who can't go home, and probably about a third of them won't be able to go home, we resettle them to those countries farther away from the place of crisis the Australias, the Canadas, the South Americas, and others. That's our job. So all states come together in an orderly managed system in a way that costs less, provides predictability, does not force refugees to get onto boats with traffickers and smugglers in order to save their lives. That's another fallacy, by the way. This whole anti-smuggling thing just makes me ill. It makes me ill because, A, the Refugee Convention allows people to arrive illegally. It is specifically prohibited to penalize people for arriving illegally. Why? Because there is not one country in the world that allows refugees to arrive legally to seek asylum. And the drafters of the convention knew that. No refugee wants to be smuggled. They certainly don't want to be trafficked. But if you've got a 50-50 shot of getting across the water or a 100% risk of your house being bombed in Syria, which are you going to do? I'd get on the smuggler's boat. So we need a system that cuts smugglers and traffickers out of the equation by providing safe access routes. And we could do that, I think, if the countries of destination understood that wherever you arrive may not be where you stay. It's just the point of entry into the international system. Then states would have no more incentive to slam their borders shut and force people to sneak in using smugglers or traffickers. There are lots of great ideas on the table right now great academic ideas that have been around for a quarter century. They have been tested and vetted with governments. They are ready to be test piloted. What we need is simply a commitment to do something now instead of chattering about it. And the problem with the UN's meeting of last September is it's created a chatterbox. It's another two years now before we actually, we've got a plan to have a plan. And the plan is to have a plan to have plans anytime something happens that is big and large scale. We don't need any of that. 
We won't get the economies of scale that we would get by getting rid of the current mechanisms, rechanneling the money we waste on domestic status assessment into a more efficient international globalized system that would actually let every refugee, wherever she is, get the same level of dignity until and unless she can safely go home. That ought to be the goal here. And that's exactly what the Refugee Convention says. So why renegotiate the Convention if the Convention is right and the mechanisms are wrong? 